Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for adramofoutlander.com. For all things Outlander from the Diana Gabaldon book series to the Stars TV series and anything interesting that falls between. This is episode 178. And we've begun season five of the Outlander TV series with episode one, The Fiery Cross. Hello! I'm back! So, after a lengthy hiatus for completing my bachelor's degree and several life events, I am back for this season of Outlander on Stars. Thank you for sticking with me. And though I did not finish the Fiery Cross read-along, I barely got into it. I'm actually sort of glad that I didn't continue because after viewing the first episode of season five, it's completely different. (laughs) Already, it's completely different. And I think it really gave me some fresh perspective from the book material that it was adapted from. Now, I was in... Hollywood for the Los Angeles premiere uh, last week on the 13th of February. And I was with a dear friend, Gina, who came with me. I thought that this was the strongest premiere episode next to season one, the very first episode. I think that Matt did an amazing job writing this episode and incorporating the spirit of the gathering and everything that was important from it, including some really sweet details. I've only watched the episode twice, so I have not picked up on all the Easter eggs. So if you have any little Easter egg shots that you noticed that I didn't see, please leave a message at 719-425-9444 or drop me an email at a dram of outlander at gmail.com or you can leave me a message on the dram of outlander page or group on Facebook or the Dram of Outlander Twitter account. So there's lots of options <laughs> for you to go to. So again, I just want to say thank you for maintaining your interest in the podcast. Everything in my life simply got away from me and I had to hyper focus. I'm continuing to do school in preparation for hopefully attending nursing school next year in 2021. And currently my youngest is a senior in high school and we will be seeing him off to college. I'm hoping in January as well as a transfer student and going from there, it's been quite hectic these last several months. I'm really thankful that the show is back and to see the direction it's going. So when we left the last season, Roger had come back to Brianna at River Run. Jamie was angry that Roger didn't come back right away and needed some time to think. The guy's a professor. He needs a little time to process. And he was abused and enslaved. So he needs a little time there. (laughs) As well as to process everything that happened to Brianna that he was told, right? We had Mercosta. You know, people are shipping that. We had the relationship between Jocasta and Murta. It's pretty spicy. So we have people in their 20s, people in their 50s, and people in their 60s having sex, which is pretty awesome for a TV show. Yes, It's in the books, but hey, what translates into TV is not always the same. Like, they all have shaved legs and 
non-hairy armpits. So, you know, everything doesn't translate to a modern audience. <laughs> anyway, uh, you may hear my cat. She is rumbling around this recording box right now. She happens to be on the ceiling peering in. And though she is very cute, she is not quite as cute as Adzo. And hopefully she will be kind. She is trying to get in. I may have to unlock the door and let her in. <laughs> so if you hear meowing and scratching, that's my sweetie butterscotch. And she is very cute. I'm looking at her face right now. <laughs> So we have all these things happening on top of the fact that Murtaugh was positioned in opposition to Jamie with his ideas about the regulators and being the leader of the regulators. Now, for those of you who have read the books, know that Murtaugh replaced a couple other characters. And in that, he is totally put in Tryon's line of fire, right? Governor Tryon. So Governor Tryon as sort of payment for Jamie and Claire getting all those acres in the mountains was that Jamie would get a militia together and would take care of this regulator problem. Now we heard about it last season and then at the end it was basically I want Murtaugh Fitzgibbon's head right that's what I want and you need to bring it to me and this is your payment to me for it the other thing that had a thread running through it is that Jocasta really wanted to see Brianna married <laughs> she was very unhappy that she wasn't married and had a baby and like huh her thought was, well, we can just adjust the birth certificate. <laughs> the baby will be a preemie when full term, you know, that sort of nonsense of the time. Hey, that stuff was still going on I, in my childhood, in like my teen years. I actually had a friend who ended up going to an unwed mother's home in 19, what was it, 84. 84, 85. So we're talking in the mid 80s to an unwed mother's home because her parents were horribly embarrassed that she had gotten pregnant out of wedlock and she ended up adopting out her baby. Yeah. They were quite progressive. <laughs> and I still know young women who are routinely kicked out of their homes because they become pregnant today. So it is not something that we are foreign to, but our culture has changed quite a bit in the last 40 years in comparison to, I think, most times prior to that. So we had that kind of thread, too, as well as Jocasta naming Brianna her heir when Jamie was like, basically said, hell no, am I doing that? He can't own slaves. Claire refuses to own slaves. And Brianna, though horrified by the fact, it's just what her aunt did. And she was under her aunt's wing for much of the pregnancy just for safety when Claire and Jamie and young Ian went off to find Roger. And that took quite a bit of time. So there's a different relationship between Brianna and Aunt Jocasta, even though she wasn't like, yes, I'll be your heir and run river run. <laughs> okay, so that's, there's a lot of dynamic going on. The other thing that happened was Lord John had agreed to marry Brianna in order to keep everybody off her tail, right? And then he wasn't even there at the end, though a really beautiful letter was written, so we got to hear Lord John's voice. Because, come on, that was really sad. Like, they didn't even have a proper, I guess, goodbye on screen for us. And then we have Stephen Bonnet, right? 
we have the horrible rape and then Brianna feeling like she needed to go to the jail and forgive him. I mean, and tell him that the child could be his, but she didn't say the child could be his. She said the child was his. I mean, she wanted to give a dying man some peace. Really? Because he was going to be hanged. Well, all this was going on. The jail was blown up. It was just all these things converging at the same time. And he survived. Hmm. Though we didn't know for sure he survived. Yes, so... We have Stephen Bonnet, and we have the paternity hanging over our head as we're coming into this new season. The other thing is that Claire knows, Roger knows, Brianna knows that the American Revolution is going to happen. And, ja you know, so Claire keeps telling Jamie, it's fine, do whatever you have to do because there'll be a point where you just switch allegiance for the winning side and for what you really believe in. Like Jamie doesn't believe in following Tryon. It's an end to that the means are justified in his mind. But while he's under the aegis of Tryon, he is going to be loyal and true to his word. That's the kind of man Jamie is. So he is going to stand up against the regulators as needed. So I don't have a full regular script for this episode. I decided that this season we're going to do stuff kind of different. I'm not going to do a play-by-play. -play. I'm going to go over the most important things that I think, things that are foreshadowing, and I'm going to talk about the impressions and feelings and just have it a slightly different structure Partly it's because I've been away from the podcast for several months. And the other part of it is it's a new season, new eyes. And we have new customer. Everything is being done slightly different. This is, we've seen the evolution of the show and also where Sam Hewen and Katrina Balf are both producers of the show. So now they have buy-in to the show and they have more of a voice than they did as actors. So it's going to be a little bit different. One of the things about this episode, and it was directed by Stephen Wolford, I think I wrote down. If I got that wrong, I apologize. I will look it up. And it was written by Matt Roberts. Now, how the writing room works is you have one lead writer and then all the other writers pitch in and they end up with a script. <laughs> so, but Matt was the lead writer on this. Which Matt being a major fan, to me, is really important. And this is where we get the chasm of a very large book volume in The Fiery Cross and it has to be distilled down to, what, 12 episodes? So this is where the creativity of a writer and a seasoned writer really comes into play. And what I mean by that is I think it's something like 20% of the book. Is it 20%? Yeah, roughly. 20% of the book is taken up by something called The Gathering. And it's a huge chunk, right? It could have been edited down to being much smaller. It is the longest two weeks and the longest 24 hours ever written in book history, I swear. No, I don't really know that. <laughs> I'm being hyperbolic. However, it is this extraordinarily detailed section of the fiery cross that has to be again distilled down into something portable easy to address and easy to adapt and put on the screen to make sense well the gathering itself could be like a whole season of a tv show that's how in-depth it was if you haven't read the book 
So what I loved about this is it was a genius diabolical plot. <laughs> Whether Matt Roberts came up with it or somebody else in the writers' room, or if it was Tony or Ron,、uh, Meryl, whoever came up with this, or if it was a group effort, extreme brilliance.、Uh, and my appreciation for how they figured this out was most excellent. So they took this huge chunk of the book and put it in one episode. It is shockingly well put together. It is cohesive. It has every element that we needed. We ha- has the drama. It has the humor. It has the conflict between characters. It has history. It has memory. It has bonding. It has. Aspects that move the story forward. It connects the storylines that we came from, leaving last season, and it connected all them all together in one really beautiful episode. And I know that many viewers had lots of tears during this episode. I have to watch multiple times before the emotion really overwhelms me because I'm watching with sort of a critical eye. Even if I'm trying just to watch and absorb, like I did at the premiere, and we ended up having seats that were second row. It was pretty spectacular to be that close. When there were 1,500 people, we were like just left of center. It was amazing. So even when I was just trying to be absorbed, my little brain squirrel was like, "Oh, and this goes here, and this goes here, and this is over here, and this is from that, and oh, that's a great connection." So I was trying, and <laughs> just to allow myself to be carried into the story, but it was really difficult. And I'm actually very thankful that I just am not fresh off of the fiery cross reading because I literally put the book down when I. Put it down and stopped the read along in the podcast. I literally put it down for myself as well, except for small snippets I would listen to here and there. And I think that's actually was really wise of me because I didn't have the book elements so close to my heart. Even though I know them, and obviously in general, I've read the book several times, but it wasn't so in my face and in my heart that I would be sitting there and doing this massive comparison thing in my head over and over again, and that it overshadowed what was being given to us on screen. And I really wonder how it affected you all as well. So the opening, and if I have this incorrect, please correct me. You know I like the constructive criticism. Is a cold open. It just it didn't open where last season ended. It opened totally different. They were at the ridge. The big house had been mostly built. The new house. Roger and Brianna were given the original cabin, which is freaking amazing. I could live in that cabin. It just needs a bathroom, <laughs> like it needs a flush toilet, even a composting toilet. Like that's all it needs, or a fire toilet. But、um, if you're not familiar, there are toilets that you can get that you you actually burn the substance inside. <laughs> If you don't have a composting one that you're adding things to all the time to keep the smell down and to absorb the waste. Anyhow, I would totally love that cabin. That's my like dream cabin. Seriously, and part I'm just going to back up for a second, and part of the beauty of all the sets is that even though. 
they're being adapted from something probably a lot more rustic and crude, right, in the books. It's the fact that they have to be able to fit cameras in there, and they have to be able to fit crew in there. And so they're going to be slightly bigger, like Jamie's cave. They're, when he was done bonnet. So they're going to be a little bit grander, a little roomier, a little brighter than they would have actually been in the late 1700s when we didn't have electricity and <laughs> running water and lots of amenities, right? So they're going to look a little nicer. And considering the fact that Jamie and Claire, though they have wealth on paper and they have the stones, they don't have monetary wealth. It's not liquid. So they're getting things by bartering or selling items they have, etc. And so it wouldn't quite be so grand, but God bless them because they are beautiful sets. So we open this time, uh, this cold open shows Murtaugh talking to a young Jamie after his mother Ellen passes away in, after childbirth or in childbirth. And he reminds young Jamie of the oath that he swore to him on the day he was born. And the, the end of this oath is, but I'll always be with you, always. And so that was him reaffirming his oath as his godfather. And that was the opening. And I, we saw some press about this over the last few months. And it was really beautiful. And the little boy they had playing young Jamie was just a pumpkin pie. Just so cute. So we get that reinforcement of that relationship between Jamie and Myrta, right? And how important it is. And as we move into the episode, we're like, huh, we're definitely not a river run. <laughs> and Brianna's getting ready for her wedding day. And she's got this gown that has all this hand done florals on it and no it's not white satin as Claire said it's not this satin dress that she kind of dreamed of right but it's this dress that very much suits Brianna and she has her hair done up and she's we have this lovely moment between mother and daughter and we see Jamie helping Roger shave because Roger starts to shave with the straight edge. Ugh. They're so scary. I'm in a sidebar for a sec and my almost 20 year old asked for one of those for Christmas to shave with. So I bought him one to try. Of course, no, I did not buy the $125 one. I bought him a lesser expensive one that actually you put a razor blade in to use in the straight edge. It's, yeah. I figured if he liked the style, then he can invest in a nice one or ask for one for his birthday coming up. But I was like, you're going to shave with what? You no, know, it's a little more ecologically friendly. Yes, 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 I get it. Than disposable razors for sure. But when Roger nicked himself, it just makes me wince. And as a matter of fact, when I got on Sunday, after I'd gotten home from California, I was cleaning a knife and I was cutting strawberries up, and I totally sliced across my finger, and it made me think about Roger. <laughs> I had the episode on my brain, and I was dreaming about it. But Roger nicking himself, and Jamie then, it was so funny, puts on his specs so he could see better. Um, and shaves Roger, and they have conversation. And in this conversation, that revelation and kind of that tension of Roger being a man out of time. Like, Brianna was prepared. Frank prepared her by teaching her to shoot and how to camp and how to do horseback riding. And, I mean, Frank knew that it was that she was probably a traveler like her mother and 
wanted to give her every advantage from being a city girl. She was a city girl from Boston. He was like, what, MI5? He wasn't a hunter. He wasn't an outdoorsy guy. He taught her how to do everything. Sorry, I'm enjoying a beautiful cup of citrus green tea. I had to have tea in honor of the podcast and them all loving tea so much. No, there isn't any whiskey in it. I don't know if I have any whiskey on hand right now. I know, horrors, right? <laughs> I think I drank it last time I was sick. Anyway, so we, we're looking at Roger's character and Jamie's concerns because Roger can't just go teach at a university. He can't just sing for his supper and protect and care for his family. I mean, the, the role of men was very, it had a very different purpose than it does today. And Roger was not well equipped for any of it at all. And so this was really highlighted in that scene. And it looks like Jamie has misgivings about Roger as a son-in-law because of his weaknesses or lack of skill. But that's not what I think it was. I think it was because he really feared for him and he wanted him to be safe because he loved this young man, even though they were still getting to know each other and he still was a little angry at him for not immediately saying, yeah, I'm coming back and I love her no matter what. It wasn't easy for Frank, but he accepted Claire and baby Brianna. He just loved her to death. But he knew for sure that this baby came from another man. He who never wanted to adopt a child. And it's interesting for Jamie to be concerned about Roger's reaction because Jamie had adopted children all along the way, including his stepdaughters, right? So to me, he should understand the challenges in that. And that sometimes a man just has to think. <laughs> so we see that, and there's that tension there, and we're not exactly sure where it's from. And I love how Roger says he cannot build or farm or hunt or ride a horse or wield a sword, but he will find a trade to take care of his family. And he had asked Murtaugh to make a wedding ring because he's a silversmith for Brianna. And he made this stunning ring. And Roger is just overwhelmed by how beautiful it is. And it's a really beautiful ring. I hope they sell it on the Outlander website, the store. It's really a stunning ring. And... You know, Jamie says, like, basically only the best for my little girl, right? Now, we have to remember, though time has passed, it hasn't been that much time. They were saying in the clear over in the beginning that seasons had passed. Well, it was supposed to be, what, summer when Roger came back? So now it's fall. So a season had passed. I don't think it'd been over the year. <laughs> the baby was still tiny, and not even crawling yet, so a small baby. And Roger's scars on his face, on his body, were still very fresh. And everything that happened to Brianna was very fresh as well. So we come to find out that many settlers had come with Jamie and Claire. They had been able to collect a bunch of people and go back to the ridge and that they had all pitched in to help get the house built. It was not fully completed yet, but mostly completed. And even though it wasn't totally done yet, that everybody from the ridge came to where the big house is, and they were gathering for Roger and Brianna's official wedding. Though, yes, they were hand fast, so they were considered married, but after one year and one day... They're no longer wed. 
and they would normally would have to have had a marriage ceremony, a traditional one, in order to stay married. So more than that had passed, but everybody ignored that, of course. And it's really lovely. We get to see some familiar faces, like Lord John, of course, Fergus and Marsley and Germain were there, and Governor Tryon was a wedding crasher. <laughs> but we got to see some familiar faces and got to meet some new ones, which we'll talk about in a minute. But I loved the moments between Claire and Brianna, where Claire is just so happy to be with Brianna because she never thought she could be after she made the decision to go back in time to Jamie. And that she can be with her is the most special thing. We don't always get to see Claire being the most maternal. We don't get to see her in that element all the time. And so seeing that tenderness from her instead of her being action Claire as a physician or doing something with Jamie, to me is really wonderful. And it's really a lovely moment to see. Now for Jamie's side of preparing for the wedding, besides help talking to Roger and shaving him and giving him the ring, his preparation for the wedding was something that was symbolic. It was something that was emotional and modern. Something old, something new, something borrowed, and something blue. So Brianna had re returned to the past, or gone to the past, I should say, with her grandmother Ellen's pearls. So we have the old, we have the whiskey being the new, and the borrowed and blue are the flowers. So he makes her a bouquet and brings her everything. And he's so touched when he sees her, when he brings her this tray. And she's amazed that he would remember. Jamie's pretty sentimental. He knows things are fleeting. He knows there sometimes aren't tangible things to hold on to. So making these wonderful memories and being really present is important. So they also have this really sweet father and daughter moment. And at the end of it, she says, je suis prêt, when he asks if she's ready. So this is cementing her as his daughter, right? Because that's his family saying, je suis prêt. And we're really seeing them, even though they still are getting to know each other. It's still a fresh relationship. And the anger that she had when Roger was sent off, <laughs> thinking that it was her rapist, that they're rebuilding. And they're seeing the important things now. So that's all the beginning of the episode. And so we're seeing relationship building. We're seeing connections. The, the thought that Frank couldn't be there even if she'd gotten married in the 20th century. Frank would have been gone. And I like that he was brought up because he was the one who prepared her for all of this. And he should have been able to be there. He was also her father. And I know that Frank is such a character that creates division. Incredible division. But he is such an important character. And I think, as I've said so many times in the past, he is an unsung hero of these books. Frank without saying anything, prepares Brianna in multiple ways. And we still have yet to see all the ways and how fortuitous he was is that he 
put things in place so Claire would know that Jamie didn't die and could make a decision, that she would search. So as selfish as he seemed at times, and he held on to Claire a little bit too tight maybe, the fact that he put things into place so she could be happy if that's what she wanted. No, he didn't tell her when Brianna was small. But he did tell her. He did point her in the right direction. So I happen to really love Frank. (laughs) I don't know if I love them together, but I love Frank. I mean, I think they made their way. And we will never know whether or not Frank ever cheated on Claire. In the books. In the show he did. And that she was okay with it. Which I just rolled my eyes pretty hard. But we'll never know. But I'm glad that they made a little homage to Frank and brought him into the wedding also. Because he was part of the family. No matter what anybody might say about it. So as this wedding continues, the spirit of the gathering is brought in. The Frasers are here as if it was a clan gathering. And that's how Jamie like says the wedding is beginning (laughs) when he and Brianna come out onto the porch and he walks her down the aisle to where the ceremony will take place. And it was so interesting to see Roger all clean shaven. It was just, it was very shocking to me to see him that way. We've seen him bearded so much. So the other people that we get to see are John Quincy Myers, the mountain man, and Ancho Costa is there with Ulysses. And everybody is so happy because it's a wedding. I mean, who doesn't love a wedding? Even if you're the most jaded person in the world, like everybody loves a wedding. I'm a sap. I love a wedding. Even though I full well know 55% will be divorced. (laughs) I just try not to think about it. You know what other thing I love? Love is I love watching Say Yes to the Dress. I'm such a dork. It just makes me happy to see people just finding joy in something as simple as finding a dress and planning for their future and having so much hope. This world is such a difficult place. We have hardships all the time. There are tragedies all the time. We rarely seem to hear excellent news. If social media tells us anything, right? And sitting there and seeing somebody be so hopeful for the future and so in love and so happy. Goodness. That just makes my heart soften up a little bit. It makes me think, okay, yeah, things are good. (laughs) And I'm a total sap, and I'm so not girly. But seriously, if you're going to, like, make me put something nice on, I'm going to clean up. I mean, it's just just because it's not my everyday being. It's I love it. It just makes me, like, happy. So who doesn't love a wedding? I mean, come on. You get to dance sharing people's love for each other, eat food, catch up with people you probably haven't seen in a while, and help someone embark on their future. Like, it's amazing. So this wedding had all those elements. People who hadn't seen each other in a long time got to reconnect. All the people got to see the culmination of their hard work in this beautiful big house being mostly built. They got to see young love be glorified, right? You know, and get elevated into marriage and moving into their future. It's wonderful. And we get to see this, all this work and all this time and all this challenges and difficulty and hardships turn into something as beautiful as a simple marriage ceremony. And I will say... I was so pleasantly 
happy, surprised to see such excellent chemistry between Sophie Skelton and Richard Rankin. Like, I, I believed them. I believed them standing up in front of their crowd of friends and family. And I believed their intention. I love that. I'm so happy. <laughs> now, it being a Protestant wedding, of course, was a huge problem for Jamie, right? Because he thinks they're all, they all have hair ticks. Oh my gosh, Jeremiah. So great. Don't touch my hair. Grandpere says Presbyterians or Protestants all have hair ticks. Uh, <laughs> yes, heretics. Hmm. So, yes, Jamie does believe that. <laughs> so we have that humor. And we have that, again, that tension. It's not about perfection. It's about family. It's about standing together. It's about that bond. But he still doesn't have to like that there's a Presbyterian minister marrying them. <laughs> and they're not doing the Catholic rites. And it was really sweet because as you pan into the audience of wedding attendees, they're remembering their own special day. Marceline Fergus and Claire and Jamie, and you could see others in the crowd remembering their day. I think weddings do that to everyone. And it does. It causes us to reflect and again gives us hope for tomorrow. It gives us hope for the future. So they do have this great ceremony. They pledge themselves. Wonderful kiss. Everybody's excited. And they have this drinking and feasting. And they did have the roasted pig. The roasting pig. And if you did read the book, there's this hilarious scene about people arguing about barbecue and what's good and what's... People still argue about barbecue. So there was a nod to the barbecue and a nod to the grand feast and the drinking and dancing. And so, again, Matt Roberts did an excellent job just boiling down the gathering to this one episode because all of the spirit was still there. Oh, my goodness. Now, the funny thing about Joe Costa is that woman knows how to throw shade better than anyone else in the entire cast. There is no, it's like she's not passive aggressive. She's just not blunt in your face. She is just, yes, queen of shade. She just slides it in. She is a politician amongst politicians. She knows how to play better than anyone. That is a Mackenzie trait for sure. <laughs> I loved it when she goes up and says, wet at last. <laughs> because she was trying to get Brianna married off hard before that baby came, before she was really showing too much. So you think that like college drinking games are something new? Oh, no, they're not. They're not. They were playing a really fantastic drinking game where somebody had to say a riddle or some sort of monologue and get it correct. Because if they didn't get it right, they had to drink more. It's not quite pong, beer pong, but hey, close enough. <laughs> and so... People are getting it. Somebody gets it right, and then Fergus gets it wrong, and Marsley told him he would have done better in French. <laughs> and then Marsley kills it with this body little saying. And then Lord John gets picked next. Picked, goodness gracious, gets picked next. And he says, some Shakespeare, anyone? <laughs> 
and the silence grips the group of playing drinkers. And then John Quincy Meyer says, no, and everybody laughs. And then they said that Lord John forfeit his turn and he had to drink. I would have loved to have hear, heard, heard. You can tell I haven't done the podcast in a while. I would have loved to have heard Lord John quoting Shakespeare. I just love him. So we just see the party going on, and everyone is having a good time and dancing and drinking and feasting, like I said. Granny Claire is drinking and watching over the baby. <laughs> this is the point of the wedding after party where people just start talking amongst themselves, right? And so I guess I am going in order of the episode because I didn't take notes. I just did not write a script this time. Where, like, Jocasta told Roger she wants to speak to him before they leave. And Lord John and Jamie are talking and off, and Lord John is telling Jamie about Willie, who's in England, and he's loving the ladies, and he loves to party, basically. You know, the ups and downs of a teenager. Uh, but he's back in England. But then, as Brianna, I don't know where she's going. She's probably going to look for the, the loo. Uh, she hears Lord John and Jamie talking about Bonnet and that he survived. He did not die in the jail. And so her worst fears are now there. Right? And she is just taken aback and she hears this and is now very upset and she tries to like get herself reorganized before going back and seeing the baby and talking to her mother. So Bonnet is definitely alive. Okay. So Roger has not publicly or privately claimed formally. This is a time when things are done formally, okay? Where he has not said in uncertain terms that this child is his. He's not given the baby an oath. He's not done any of that yet, okay? So now we have to think, you know, is he really, who is the dad, right? Who's the biological dad? It's, it's going to be ongoing, is it not? So as everybody's starting to split up and people are like heading off to bed and heading off into smaller groups of people and talking, Jocasta goes to visit Murtaugh in the woods. Ulysses takes her out there, and I'm like, where the hell is Ulysses sleeping? He can't, did he go back to camp without her? Like, that wouldn't rouse suspicion. Now, I remind you, Tryon ended up being a wedding crasher. He just shows up without an invitation because he showed up with a troop. We find out later he's leaving for Jamie to go Murtaugh hunting, go regulator hunting, right? So he just shows up at the wedding and tried not to take over, but he's a total ass. And then we still don't know the detail until the next day. But Murtaugh is his, like, number one complaint. And he's very angry at Jamie for not hunting Murtaugh Fitzgibbons yet and bringing him into justice to be hanging in the square at New Bern. So she's going to get, you know, some love and home with Murtaugh in his rustic cabin. See, his cabin is what Jamie and Claire's cabin should have looked like. Very rustic, but with a pantry for the pig. <laughs> I'm like, but where did Ulysses sleep? Did he bring a little pop tent? <laughs> Poor guy. So she and Murtaugh have a good time. And this good time is happening 
while Brianna and Roger are in the cabin together and he's singing a song to her. I will put a, the YouTube video link in to the write-up, the post on the website. Anyway. And so Roger serenades her with a modern song from the 20th. And Marcelie announces to Fergus that she's pregnant again with her second. And Jamie and Claire are in their room in the big house with Jemmy, with Jeremiah. And he's the baby's having none of it. It's hilarious. Them trying to, like, have some sexy time and the baby interrupts them. Welcome to grandparenthood. <laughs> Oh, I trying to give the married couple a night off. So all of this is going on. And one of my favorite parts that was just so like, it was sweet and sad and funny is when you're panning to the couples, right? The people and people starting to go off. As you pan to Lord John, and he's sitting on a log, and you have John Quincy Myers on one side passed out sleeping, and the other guy passed out or sleeping next to him on the ground. And then there's Lord John just sitting there all proper with his cup. And then we're like, oh, sad pan to John. <laughs> he needs a love, too, that John Quincy Myers, like, falls off and the log he's leaning on and it's very funny so there's lord john he's always a bridesmaid never the bride poor guy and we see that after brianna and roger are intimate and sanctify their marriage sexually that even though at the time she seemed okay, afterwards she's fretting and she can't sleep because she's thinking about Bonnet. That's a lot. That's a lot in an episode to get in, but we still have like 15 more minutes. <laughs> and in the, this last part, the next day in the episode, we get to meet a new character na named Josiah Beardsley. He's the hunter. And Jamie really wants him to come and live on the ridge so when Jamie's gone, he can hunt and bring in pelts because that's money, they'll just split the profits, and that's food for the settlers. And Lizzie is like, who's this young lap man? You know, she's like, oh. And they were flirting. It was very cute. Well, she was flirting. Josiah was just talking to her. <laughs> but he was waiting in line to see Claire at the surgery. The surgery, by the way, that is amazing. And if you just had running water and electricity, I think most modern physicians would love that space. There's even a bed in the surgery. Like, it's huge. And Jamie was in there helping Claire with the surgery patients, you know, and the wee beasties and that kind of thing, which are the germs. So all these things are happening. Life is kind of going back to normal. But since everyone's gathered by the big house, then they can all see Claire for their, ma their maladies that maybe they wouldn't have come five miles for if they lived further down the ridge. But something interesting in another new character that we meet, mm, sort of meet, okay, name dropped, is Duncan Innes. Now, this is a very interesting placement for me because it felt sort of abrupt that Jocasta and Murta, even though they had this conversation last season, that he's just a man that's not going to be pinned down. They can't really be together, even if they're having a, a relationship they can't really have a relationship. They can't marry. They can't be together. They're on opposing sides. Like Jocasta, for all that we know, is a loyalist, right? To the crown. And he's a regulator. And so there's all these things that are a problem. And they're laying in bed. This is not good bed talk. Not post-coital bed talk at all. It's very verboten. <laughs> but then you have to remember that when you talk about 
marriage as an institution, as a safety net, as security. It's business, and it has always been business. It's about connecting families, connecting industry, connecting, strengthening politics. It's about making good match to move the families forward, and for everyone to be taken care of, and etc. Yes, people have always married for love, but for the most part, people have married for companionability and security. That's been a lot of it. So Jocasta, if you if remember correctly, because she's a woman, she can't own her own property when she's married. So when she's married, her property goes into the hands of a husband. Ulysses, being African American, slave, he can't be her voice, even though he's her eyes and ears and hands. Murtaugh is definitely not in a position to do that. He's an outlaw. He's a renegade. So you got to check Murtaugh off that. He's like, nope. But she can't do all the business she needs to do for River Run, even though she's deft at running it, because she doesn't have a husband, and she hasn't had a husband in quite some time. So she says that Duncan Innes has proposed marriage. So Duncan Innes had been at Ardsmere. This is what they talked about, and Murtaugh and Jamie knew him. He'd been at Ardsmere. He's a good guy, and he settled in North Carolina. So he proposed marriage to her. So that tells me there's going to be another marriage. Duncan Innes is going to be a character that we're going to know, and we book readers expected him last season. <laughs> Actually, expected him in Ardsmere and on the boat. Like we expected to see him the whole time, but. We, they really needed a vehicle for her because some things that are coming up. Murtaugh cannot be that character. So though he kind of took over some other characters and stayed alive so far, this is a place he cannot inhabit as a character. So we hear about Duncan Innes, and Murtaugh basically told her, "Girl, I can't be that for you." So I'm not going to stand in your way. And then she dropped his hand. And my husband said, "That's quite telling." <laughs> yes, it is quite telling. <sighs> so he's releasing her from whatever bond they have because they can't have anything legitimate or legal in their time. They just can't do it. It would be a very bad decision on her part. She could literally get all her stuff taken away. So there's an imbalance of power between Jocasta and Murtaugh, but him being on the other side of the law would cause her a lot of problems. So he has to release her. So he's, and she has to be able to release him as well. So I don't know what time this is. They must wake at like 4 a.m. or something. Because back at camp, back at the big house where all the tents are, and Jocasta has a very nice tent, and she has furniture set up and everything. It's very luxurious. Roger comes to speak to her before they decide Jocasta and Ulysses decamp, right, and leave. Now, it's quite a journey. I'm trying to remember how many miles. I didn't look it up again, but it's something like 100 miles, 118 miles. It's quite far to go from River Run all the way up into the mountains to Fraser's Ridge. So they're not just staying for a few days. Like, they're going to stay for a week or two because it's a several-day journey, especially for somebody who is blind. Like, she can't just ride her own horse easily, right? And plus they have the tent and all the belongings, so they have to have a cart and horses and the whole nine yards. So this is... It's going to be a multi-day trip back. So there's, they've been there for a while now. And Roger's going to talk to her as he said he would. And this is where, again, we get to see just what a politico she is. How amazing Auntie Jo is. So she basically throws all this crap at him. And she's being rude and obnoxious and saying Brianna's no longer her heir. 
She's saying Jeremiah's her heir because once a woman marries, her property goes to the husband and Roger might just be this gold digger. Like nobody knows who his family is. She doesn't say this, but it's inferred. No one knows who he is. He has no skills. He has no money. He's just this guy. (laughs) So he's bringing nothing to the table. So he could be a money grubbing dude. Secondly, the baby might not be his. And some men don't take kindly to bairns who are not their own. So might he mistreat this boy if Brianna's the heir and Brianna gets the money and Rod, then it's Roger's property, etc. So she's saying all this stuff that to Roger comes across really a-hole-like. I mean, she's just being obnoxious, right? So at the end of this conversation, Roger gets really mad because she keeps pushing it. She like apologizes for being rude and then she pushes it even further. And then he says, he, he walks off and he turns around and he comes back. Let me put this very plainly. I do not want your money. My wife does not want your money and my son will not have it. Cram it up your hole, eh? So Roger very publicly tells Joe Costa, Mackenzie, Cameron, 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 (laughs) to cram it up her hole. And he does this very publicly. Now, the funny thing is, is that they put in the show, Ulysses leaning over and giggling, giggling, he kind of laughed and said, oh, is that the react? you know, is that what you wanted? And it was better than the reaction she wanted. Because her purpose in doing that, it's her own personal test, right? Are you a man? Are you going to stand up? Are you going to tell me to like shut up? Are you going to tell me to stick it? Are you going to prove your worthiness, right? But it also gave Roger street cred, which in the 18th century, all you had, right, was your street cred. Now, it somewhat matters what your reputation is and who your family is. Dep- I mean, if you're in that top tenth of a percent of blue bloods in this country, I would guess I would say are very old established families who run at the, you know, those very influential families who still run that way, then it really does matter. They still make political marriages. They still do things in the old way. But it's such a tiny percentage of people anymore that now people get upset if you're marrying into a different religion. Some people get upset if you're marrying a different culture just because they don't know anything about it and it's scary or whatever their reason. They're bigoted. But who your family is, what your family history is, your lineage, your reputation generally is not that important except what people know about you in front of you. Do they generally know who you are? Do you seem like a decent human? Does it look like you love this person? Do you care? Are you a good guy or a good woman? Like, that's what people care about. They're not delving into your generations. And there were no Mackenzies who could speak for Roger. Jamie was the only one who spoke for him. And Brianna and Claire. Uh, Not like he could say, yeah, I'm your great, great, great nephew. Great, 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 great nephew. Yeah. He can't, he can't say that I'm a descendant of Galus Duncan and your brother. Like, so there's no one to speak for Roger. He has nothing. He has no history, no legacy, no trade, no money, no possessions. He is blank, which puts him at the bottom of the social totem pole. So Auntie Joe not only got her personal test box checked, like he passed, she was able in that moment to give him incredible credibility and give him social standing. Like she took him from the bottom rung of social status because remember Jamie had been an outlaw. 
He's new to the colonies. She's not. She's been there for a while. So this just skyrocketed Roger up the social strata. So now people are going to be like, oh, it's Roger back. You know, like on his own because of what he did and stood up to Joe Costa and everyone's going to talk about it. She's going to make sure everybody hears what happened. So that way it's like, oh, he's that Roger Mack. So that way he's recognizable. He's a known entity and he's somebody who has a backbone. He's courageous, right? He's loyal. So I love that. That was just like, yes. And that is taken right from the book. And it's one of those moments where you're like, because, you know, like Roger doesn't know she just played him. Roger doesn't know she was testing him. Roger doesn't know she was hoping to set a foundation for his social rise and for his reputation to now have something with gravity attached to it. So that was pretty cool. That made me like cheer inside. (laughs) So we're going to see Mr. Beardsley again. And he has to have surgery on his tonsils, right? But Claire also mentions a brand that he has on his hand for thievery. And it, they just touched on it. So there's a few things they just mentioned in passing. The brand, Roger presuming they're going back to the 20th. Like, there's just a few little things that are said, okay? And that's one of those little strings that we're going to have to follow. So Jamie goes to outside and runs into Tryon, and now Tryon does the full court press. He's leaving Knox, which is also Scottish, by the way, um, with Jamie, a whole troop, to go Murta hunting. Reminds me of Winnie the Pooh. All I can see, all I see is like Pooh Bear with and Christopher Robin. <laughs> That's what I heard in my head. It's my brain squirrel. She's funny. She hasn't stopped being funny. So Tryon is really pushing Jamie and basically telling him in no uncertain terms, if you don't deliver Fitzgibbons, I'm taking your land. Everything you've done here is forfeit. You have not followed through on your end of the contract. And he says, you're here because you're one of them, because he's a Scot. And a lot of the backcountry people are Scots. And North Carolina has a lot of Scots. And Murtaugh, Fitzgibbons, yeah, of course, he's his godfather. He's a Scot, right? So Tryon is, like, just holding Jamie's feet to the fire before he leaves. And Knox is like, mm, girl, we're here. We're leaving in a week. So this makes Jamie just, he's mad. And he goes in the house and Claire's like, whoa, what's going on? And he's like, if he wants a Scott, I'll give him a Scott. (laughs) Because Tryon wants the regulators handled. It just happens to be that a Scott is overseeing the regulators as their leader in the show. (laughs) So Tryon, you know, of course... He's got the crown, like, breathing down his neck, and he's got to get things in his colony straight so he can go to someplace better, right? He want a better post. So Jamie goes in and goes into his trunk, and my husband was like, that's a beautiful trunk, babe. <laughs> John Gary Steele knew how to, like, get the art department and everything going. The set design is beautiful. I don't know who picked out that trunk, but it is gorgeous that Jamie's stuff was in. And he has his kilt and his sword and his whole, his whole purdifying outfit, his war outfit, everything outfit. So Jamie goes and changes and puts on his kilt and dresses up in his finery. And he comes back and Claire was like, whoa, (laughs) whoa, girl, you look good. And, you know, Mitchell's like, oh, yeah, she's going to want to jump Jamie now. I was like, I know. Scott looks good in their kilt, right? So uh, Jamie's like now on the war path. 
so to speak. He knows. And they touched on it when he and Claire were talking about she believes the men of the Ridge will follow him. But what they didn't discuss is the fact that in Scotland, when he was laird, they the men follow you because they have sworn to you. They have fealty to you. They're your people. Well, in this new world, this new land on the ridge, well, he might be the one who had them settle, but they got no fealty to him. They have no loyalty except to follow through on their contract, right? They're not his men. They don't know him. They're not family. So this is what Jamie's thoughts are. And while he's working up his plan, Roger goes back to the cabin where Brianna and Jemmy are, and he said this is something he should have done a long time ago. And he pricks his thumb, and he presses the blood to the baby and swears an oath over Jemmy. His blood oath, you are blood of my blood and bone of my bone. I claim thee as my son before all men from this day forever. Now, I wish that would have been more public in front of Jamie and Claire, something in front of other people, but Brianna can swear to it. Though a single person swear, you know, is not that great. But we now see that Roger has sworn an oath to his little family. The baby is his. It doesn't matter. And he has no idea that Bonnet's alive. He has no idea that Brianna's been worried about this since their wedding night. So that gives her a lot of comfort and security and safety and knowing that it doesn't matter because Roger is going to be there. He's not going to forsake her if it turns out this kiddo isn't his. So as we wrap up this episode... Jamie is all kilted up, and he's got his boots on. He's like, ready to go. I'll give him a scot. So he marches outside, and everybody is still there because of the wedding, right? There's probably still a big old feast of food left. (laughs) The band is left, but people are all still up by the big house. Again, things don't move quickly. (laughs) And people are staying to trade things, and to get seen by Claire, whatever business has to be done by the big house before they trudge back across the ridge, which is quite large, they're there. And while the men are there, Jamie's like, I'm going to get their commitment. So he goes out and he lights the cross. They had a couple of Celtic crosses for the wedding, is my guess. Present? I don't know. Maybe they did. I don't know. But they were there, beautiful wooden Celtic crosses. So Jamie comes out, lights a Celtic cross, and starts in on his speech. They're in the old country in Scotland, this is what we did. And he goes over the whole thing about needing, what if he has to call them to war, and all of these things. And so he's really, he's requesting their oath. He's requesting their fealty and loyalty to him. So he gets done with this and people are gathering close. More people are coming and gathering around and Claire and Brianna are standing there like, whoa. Brianna's like, what happened? (laughs) And they're just standing there like, ooh, right? And Jamie goes to call Roger to him. It's so funny because he was like, Claire, trust me because we have to leave in a week. Trust me, I'll take care of Roger. So he goes to call him and Roger just stands there and looks at him. And so the other guy next to him comes up and swears fealty, you know, on his blade and does that. And then afterward, (laughs) which is really funny, he calls Roger the son of his house up. And he calls him Captain McKenzie. He's like, it's okay, you'll you'll be by my side, you'll be safe. And Roger swears to him. And then he calls Fergus, son of my name and of my heart. And Marsley's like, oh, awesome. And so then all the men gather behind and they all, you presume, are going to swear their oath to Jamie, right? 
Okay, now that's not it. There's more. This episode just keeps on going. I mean, it was so expertly done. So at the end, we see Jamie and Claire uh, on that view of the bridge when they are looking out that we saw last season over and over. They're standing next to the other fiery cross because he had told the men until he lights it again. Or when he lights it again, it means they're going off to war. Okay. Which is in a week. He didn't tell him it was in a week, but whatever. So they stand there and they kind of say, okay. And then Claire's like, it's time. And then we see Jamie going to talk to Murtaugh. So we opened this episode with Murtaugh reminding Jamie of the oath that he made upon him as a newborn. And then at the end, I love that they bookended this. It's just really beautiful. And Matt Roberts said at the Q&A afterward that after the screening that this was in a different order, but it just fits so beautifully that that's how they put it together, which I agree. It's gorgeous. So Jamie meets Merton, tells him what's going on. He says, just make yourself hard to find. You have to leave. And Jamie releases Murtaugh from his oath. And it's really hard because this is his godfather who he's relied on his entire life since his mom died when he was young. This is somebody who's been his constant that he's, well, for 20 years he didn't have him. He thought he was dead. But <laughs> this is the man who even in spirit Jamie has drawn on. Right? So... It's really tough. And Murtaugh's like, you keep telling me about this outcome, but war is always coming. And Murtaugh's really tied to staying a regulator and doing this fight, even though he knows that the American Revolution is coming and the English are going to lose, that we get the impression that he's, there's no way he's going to stop. He's not going to stop. And so he kind of fixes Jamie's coat, but Jamie releases him. And that's the end of the episode. <sighs> so I don't know. Is Bertha going to survive the showdown with the regulators? We don't know. I mean, to me, that sort of like dead Murta walking. Like, what are they going to do with him? Because he really can't stay around. He can't stay in North Carolina. He's got to go. So is he just going to poof? He can't go back to Scotland. He was sent to the colonies after Ardsmere. He, where is he going to go? What is he going to do? And he's such a big name among the regulators in North Carolina, I don't know if that would carry any weight outside of that colony or, or cause him problems with the crown outside of North Carolina. My guess is that he's going to die, especially because Mercosta is like no longer a thing anymore. They've effectively broken up in my mind. It's not safe for him to be with her. She's a gotten, she needs to move forward with business so she can keep her plantation and her livelihood going. And that is probably Duncan Innes. So my guess is Murta is going to die somehow soon. Now, since he's not in the book, I can't really tell you if he's going to die. But yet, he's supposed to die already, but he didn't. So, hey, <laughs> they can do anything they want with the mighty pen, can't they? So, yeah, Jocasta's probably going to marry to Duncan down the line. That's that foreshadowing. Is there going to be some kind of crisis between Brianna and Roger because he believes they're going back to the future? Because he mentioned it and then Murtaugh was talking about it. I don't know. Right? My hands are up in the air. I'm like, I don't know. I'm making that I don't know face. We, Josiah Beardsley is coming back for his surgery, and to get the surgery, he had to agree to come and stay on the ridge. 
Uh, Lizzie took quite an interest in him, and we didn't really see much of her. So are they going to be an item? I'd say probably. What about Bonnet? Where is Bonnet? I mean, we know he's somewhere around, but what's that going to look like? So we're going to be seeing him. Hmm. There's a few things brewing. <laughs> and we didn't get to meet Adso. <laughs> Where is that darn cat? Um, Adso was actually on the red carpet, but I, I didn't get to see Adso, sadly, because I was inside. <sighs> yeah. Um, it looks like there's going to be some, the season's going to be really strong. And I'm glad to see, again, that really good chemistry between Richard Rankin and Sophie Skelton. I think that was really missing before. And to really see good emotions from her. I love the continued aging of Jamie and Claire. It's wonderful. I love seeing it. Because as my husband said, yeah, old people like to have sex and be intimate. And he says, I love seeing it. It's great. And I said, yeah. I'm like, Diana Gabaldon's really good at writing sexuality from young adult all the way through. <laughs> it's true. Uh, so he thought that was just marvelous. And considering that I'm 52 and he's 64, you know, it kind of hits a little close to home. <laughs> um, at the Q&A after the premiere screening in LA, it was so amazing. Lauren Lyle is awesome. Love her. Um, and Ed Spilliers was there, Marie Kennedy Doyle, Marco Joe Costa was there. I was going to call her Mar Costa. Duncan Lacroix was there. It was really interesting to hear Duncan Lacroix speak because he's not Scottish. So it's kind of strange to hear the accent and be like, whoa. And I guess he doesn't get recognized and Maria doesn't get recognized because they look so different than in real life. And Ed says he doesn't get recognized either. Uh, Richard Rankin is hilarious too. Super fun. And I think at the Q&A afterward is the first time Diana Gabaldon and Ron Moore have barely said anything. There just wasn't the time. Katrina Balf and I think Sam Hewen spoke the most. It was really quite good. And Katrina now has top billing. So I thought that was fascinating. But she's been in several big Hollywood movies. She's She's had so many uh, award nominees that, yeah, she's becoming quite a heavy hitter. It's amazing. And I look forward to seeing what their contributions are going to be like this season. So that wraps up the Season 5, Episode 1 podcast. I definitely want to hear your feedback. So the voice line is 719-425-9444. Please leave a message. I will include it in a podcast because it's recorded. Please email me at a drama of outlander at gmail.com. Leave me a message at the Facebook page or if you're in the Facebook group, a drama of outlander, you can leave me a message. Send me a private one. Or to the Dram of Outlander Twitter, you can send me a private message as well. But I would love your feedback, and I'm excited to be back and doing this with you. I have missed it greatly. And as always, thank you for listening, and until next time, Slange va.